Well, good morning, Southside. Thank you. That's sweet. I pray that you had a good week in walking with the Lord this week, and I'd like to welcome all of our guests. We're grateful to have you here worshiping with us. We are going to continue in our worship now by the declared Word of God. We have a beautiful table set before us this morning to feast on God's Word And at the end of the service, we're going to partake in the Lord's table together where we will remember the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we're going to bring on new members, a couple families to pray over. Um, And so let's let's journey some beautiful things this morning. Uh, Just a few announcements on Father's Day. We're going to have a special guest speaker all the way from Tijuana, Mexico. So Nick Decker is going to be in the house, and he's going to bring us the word, and we look forward to having our dear brother back, who served here as an elder for several years. And so the Deckers and the Francos in the same house, this is going to be beautiful. My joy has been made complete. Um, The evangelism seminar yesterday, heard there was a good turnout. Um, We're going to try to do them quarterly. The next one is going to be how to share with someone who's kind of ready to sit down and begin talk about the gospel. Yesterday was more cold turkey and street evangelism, and then the following one is going to be, how do you share with someone at church uh, just sitting in the pew? Um, And so we want to keep training you, maybe the one after that, how to use your home as a mission field. And so we we have some great opportunities uh, for evangelism before us. We've got the nursing home, the prison ministry is going to be uh, unfolding, how to even write letters to inmates and reach out. Uh, We've got a lot of things going on, and we'll keep uh, announcing and keeping them before you. But I want to keep growing as a culture, as we're looking at the gospel in Romans, is that we we all want to proclaim this gospel in any way that we can be a part of it. Paul said to Philippians, I rejoice that we have koinia in the gospel. We we share in it. We participate to, to make it known, proclaim it, and all work together for the glory of his name. And so I want you to keep shaping your thinking and not just, I just want to learn and go home is, man, we're, we're together for the gospel. And so I just want to keep journeying that as a church. Well, this morning, if you'll turn to Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight is just beautiful. I'm enjoying my study so much. We get to climb Mount Everest together of chapter eight, and the, and the view is going to be beautiful at the top of this chapter. So we want to go to God and pray. And here's what I'm praying is we, that Greek word epigenosis is the full knowledge of God where it's not just in the bean, but it gets into the heart. And so we want the epigenosis of what we're going to learn in Romans chapter 8. Just, it's not, the end goal is not to be smarter. The end goal is to see him clear and to know him and love him. So we're going to journey that uh, together. May God grant us that. That's my prayer. Uh, It's a big prayer that only God could do. So let's join our hearts and go before him this morning. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge this beautiful gospel that you have given to us in Christ. And Father, we can draw near to the throne of grace with boldness and confidence because of the work of Christ. And God, I thank you. I pray that no one takes that for granted, that we all are stunned and amazed that we could commune with a God that we hated and were at enmity and, and would have died that way happily. And by your grace, you have opened our eyes. You've taken us from death to life and you've caused Jesus to be a treasure hidden in a field and we would all sell all that we could have him. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. And I pray now as we uh, worship through this word that you would meet us and you would show us glorious things from your word. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, last week, if you look at uh, chapter 8, verse 1, we kind of set the context of how chapter 8 fits into Paul's explanation of the gospel that he's not ashamed of. And we kind of did a little fly over it. And this morning now, I want to begin to dig into the details of chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, (coughs) probably 1 through 3, actually, this morning And I just want to show you some of the beauty of what I got this week in my study. Your outline, I don't know if it's up on the screen or not. I got it in late. But Romans 8, 1 through 4, we're going to look at two reasons why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And we're going to look at the freedom gained in this gospel and then our frailty fixed. And so I just want to review a little bit of the foundation stone to this chapter and to our lives from last week. Look with me in verse 1. Therefore, in light of this whole gospel of Jesus Christ, he's, he's removed that there's no condemnation. So in light of what Jesus has done, believers in Christ sit here this morning with no condemnation any longer. You've been brought out from under the sphere of condemnation into the safety of Christ. Where It's like the ark. You can't even have a drop of God's wrath reach you. There's no double jeopardy. You will never, no condemnation again. But it's for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who by faith, they're, they're united to Christ and you are now in Christ, in what he did and what he uh, lived and died is now as if you did it. God will treat you uh, from his position and what Jesus has done. That's why this gospel is about Jesus Christ. Paul uses in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him, or its equivalents 164 times in this letter. If you miss Christ, you have missed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the one other word we looked at then was now. There is right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your, your, your last day sentence when you're going to stand before God, you've already been acquitted. There will be no condemnation and you can live into that right now. You don't have to spend all your days going, I wonder how it's going to go at judgment. I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad. And you just sit there uh, right now. There's just no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that can change our lives. And that's where Romans 8 is going to take us. So with that as our foundation, which is a summary of the first seven chapters, no condemnation, justification, you're not guilty before God, you're accepted, you're forgiven. Well, now we want to come and look at then, how do I make progress as a Christian? How do I get transformation into my life? And that's going to be our focus through chapter eight. Christianity offers a salvation from sin. It's a salvation from its penalty, the, the curse for breaking the law, for being sinners. That's been taken care of in Christ Jesus on the cross. And now we're going to be journeying that it takes care of the power of sin. It, it ruled and it reigned over your life. And, and now the things that you need to know and believe and fight for as a Christian, I, I don't, sin does no longer uh, reign, it remains. So I got to fight. I need to understand that it doesn't rule me and reign me anymore in this gospel and then it's going to end where you're going to be free from its presence. And the only way I can ever be free is I got to die. And so I'm journeying to that place. I want to be with Christ. And so as we begin, I've been a broken record since we started this church and since we started this book. And I'm going to keep being a broken record because once you have a broken record, kids, record, these little things that went around on a player, and if it got stuck, it just kept going the same thing again and again. And so that's what I mean by a broken record. And so the broken record is the order matters. The order matters. 90% of what I counsel is people mixing up the order or forgetting their justification. And so getting the order right is going to bring transformation, change, and Christ-likeness into your life. One of my favorite preachers, is, his foundational statement in this section is only forgiven sin can be overcome. And so if I'm fighting sin to get forgiven, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never make any progress. I'll never get right with God. But I am going into a battle where all of my sins are already forgiven because of the work of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's wanting us to get, to enter into this battle with my sins already forgiven. And that will change and empower you, not strengthen sin. And so that's where we'll be moving. So the order matters. Uh, when, when, when you fight sin so you can rest in Christ, uh, you'll never get there. So if you are seeking transformation before resting in Christ, before your sins are forgiven, it, it won't work. If you're trying to be righteous so that you can be declared righteous before God, never happen. Being right precedes doing right. It's why Romans, it's pretty simple. Romans 1 through 5 goes before Romans 6 through 8. Pardon precedes power. That's what we've been wrestling with. And it just seems so simple. But I want to warn you that this mistake can be very subtle and you don't even realize you're doing it. 
but you will, you'll live in guilt all of your days. You're just a guilt machine. That's all you feel all day long. I live in guilt. I live under condemnation. It's not uh, what we're going to see in verse 4, where he says, now you can keep the requirement of the law. You can actually love for the first time. Guilt, condemnation, they don't produce the fruit of the spirit of love. And so it's essential that we get the order right. And I want to show you from this text that the order matters is important to Paul. I want you to be convinced from the word of God. This is not just my hobby horse. It's Paul's. Therefore, it's God's. And so the question that has to be asked then is what is the relationship this morning between Romans 8.1 and Romans 8.2? If you'll look with me in verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> Romans 8.1, there's no condemnation is justification. This is your standing before God. It's really a verdict that God has made. You're not guilty. Your sins are forgiven. There's no condemnation for you, believer in Christ. That's our justification. Verse 2 now has this thing called a gar, which means for or an explanation. And so this verse 2 now is a sanctification. It's our growing in Christ into our position that we're justified, we're right before God and our practice is down here and we're trying to grow to be who we are in Christ positionally, our walk with God. And so notice the order. Verse two is for or because, and it's the ground or the evidence of verse one. Verse two is the evidence that verse one has happened. So I'm right with God and there's no condemnation. And and one of the ways I'm going to know it is that I've been set free from the law of sin and death, and I've been made alive in the law of the spirit of life. So verse 1 is the foundation and the basis for verse 2. you, you got to have verse 1 to get to verse 2. What does that mean? Quite simply, no condemnation is our foundation in which we stand. And what I've spent a year wrestling for, in which verse 2 can now take place. So the four is the explanation of verse one that has taken place. And what is more, verse three starts with a gar statement as well, another four. For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And so verse three is what God has done in Christ for you to be forgiven and not condemned. We're right back to justification. So you got verse two, which is sanctification. Just you got on the top, no condemnation. On verse three, he condemns sin in the flesh. So 8.1 and 8.3 point to your justification. And in the middle, the spirit is in you, transforming you from one image of glory to the next. So if you want it clear, flip over to Romans 7, 6. He says the same thing, just clear for me. Verse 6, but now, I just ripped my Bible, that's sin. For now we have been released from the law, justification. Having died uh, to that by which we were bound when we were under the law, needing to fulfill it to be right, so that this purpose that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so we got to be out from under law and declared not guilty before God so that now we can serve in the newness of the spirit under the new covenant. So I want you to get this, that that this is the order throughout the Bible. Justification is the foundation from which your growth, sanctification, transformation will spring. And so what that means is you can't, you can't end around it. And it seems weird, but even after all that I've been saying, I'm still meeting with people saying, wait a minute, I, I've reversed it. And you don't even realize you're doing it. So what does it look like if you're getting this wrong? How do I know? Well, this is world religions. All world religions are you got to do something to get justified, to get right with God. This is what the Pharisees did. Throughout this book, the Pharisees were trying to keep the law and be righteous so that they could be justified, that they could be acceptable to God. And so the way you'll know is you're living in a life of condemnation. 
You just, you just live under it. And, and you'll, you'll know that you've flipped these two. And as we journey through Romans, you're going to see that Paul is fighting really hard that you get the order right. The whole Reformation was built on it. Luther says you're justified by faith alone, but not by faith that is alone. It's going to produce works and growth. And that's verse 2. So the Reformation is 8-1. You got to get that. There's justification by the work of Christ alone. And verse 2, that is going to produce a changed life and sanctification in your life. And so my prayer is that everyone in this room gets the order right. Okay, that's what I've been begging God for and that you build on it rightly and you must build on it. And if this makes no sense to you, I hope it does, grab an elder, a friend next to you and understand this. It's the whole foundation of the Christian life. Till you understand this, you're not going to be able to progress. So if, if it's just, that makes no sense at all, please, we want to help you. We want to love you. Let's journey this till you understand it. Don't make the mistake that I see daily. I don't like doctrine. I don't like arguments. I don't like logic. I'm just a lover. I just do. You guys just want to learn. <laughs> I'm a doer. That's an eternal mistake. <laughs> you you got to get this right. And my prayer is for a revival in this church by an understanding of these truths. A revival in our own hearts as these truths take up our hearts and produce the obedience of faith. And we are in that verse this morning. So are you fighting to get justified or are you fighting because you are justified? That's the essence of what Paul is after. And so I pray um, that we would all get it. One, one preacher said, fight like a victor and not a victim. And I, I want us to, to lay hold of that and go forward. And so that's my prayer for this morning. So here's your outline. Two explanations, statements, as to why there's no condemnation. And so our first point is freedom gained in verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. And so what we have here is a contrast in verse 2. <clears throat> we have the law of the Spirit of life. It set you free. And we have the law of sin and death. And so we got two contrasting laws in verse 2. And what we see is that their, their principles or their operations, their, their powers, they're not like tablets, the mosaic tablets, a, a list of rules. That's not what's going on. We're right back to Romans 6, where, where you have two rulers, masters, and one leads to sanctification, which is what we're looking at in eternal life. And one leads to further impurity and further lawlessness, and it ends in death. So there's two kind of powers going on here. And I'm going to explain them as we go now. But what I would like to do is look at these two statements and understand what each one means. And then understand how does one of them set you free from the other and what that will look like. And this is big if you want to have transformation in your life. If you want to overcome sin in your life, long-term, deep sin, all sin, gross sin, respectable sin, I want you, we got to understand this verse, and it's necessary for that to happen. So the first power is the law of sin and death. I'm going to write back to Romans 5, where Adam was our representative head, and when he sinned, he brought us all now under condemnation and death. And law was the power of sin. Remember in Romans 7, the law comes now to an unbeliever and it just arouses sin and stirs it up. And we were just in this tailspin of eternal perdition. And, and, and the law couldn't pull us out. The law could only make it worse. And so instead of running to the law, it will never get you out of this tailspin. You're under the law of sin and death. And all it produces is death. And so this law of sin and death was a power. I'm going to go back to Romans 5.21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was a reign. It was a power. It was a rule. And so remember what Paul has told us. It's not a list of commands, but it's in my members. This, this sin is in my members. It, it takes my eyes, my hands, my feet, my tongue, my mind, and it causes me to use them as instruments for sin. 
Sin has no instruments of its own. It's got to use yours. And so it's, it's taking your instruments and just using you to defile the name of God in your own life. It was a power and it was an authority in every one of our lives. It made me a captive to sin. But something's going on in this verse that the law of the spirit of life has set you free from that. So we are all enslaved and bondage to the law of sin and death. But the law of the spirit of life, this is a new power that we have been talking about called the grace of God. This is the Holy Spirit taking up residence inside of you. There, there's a new sheriff in town and his name is Jesus Christ. And now you're joined to him and there's a new power, a new ruling, reigning person in your life. And he wants you to see that he has set us free from the law of sin and death, its power and its condemnation and its rule and its dominion. He's done it. He's set you free through the Holy Spirit. He's joined us to Christ. As we believe the gospel, we're under a new reign. And he rips out your stony marble heart and he gives you a new one that's full of flesh that loves him. And he writes upon it the law and he engraves it in your heart by the love of Christ. And now when the law comes, it just meets with desire. Before it met with enmity. And the work of the Holy Spirit is now it meets with a desire. And this is the law of the spirit of life. And so, so I want you to get this. How can I walk in the newness of life of Romans 6, 1 through 4? Well, the spirit of God has set you free. How can I reckon that I'm dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus because the Spirit has set you free. You're not creating it. It's happened. How can I not give my members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness? Because the Spirit has set you free from that rule and realm. Romans 7, 6, how can I, or 4, how can I bear fruit for God? Because the Spirit has set you free from that. And so what I want you to get this morning is we have a new power, a new control, and a new influence called the law of the spirit of life, children of God. And so hear this. This is so important. You can't sanctify yourself. I, I, I think I've spent half my life thinking, if I work hard enough, I can sanctify myself. It's called moralism. And what we're going to see in chapter 8 is it's the Holy Spirit who sanctifies you. The Holy Spirit is a power. It's a person of the Trinity, and he's given to you and he takes up residence within you. And by faith, you can now be tri triumphant over the law of sin and death in your life. Spirit of God. And so now it's remaining but not reigning, president but not resident. And I want you to hear this. Some of you said to me, I'm going to have to battle with sin till I die. Romans 7 is de depressing. And I want to let this lift your heart is you will battle with sin until you breathe your last. But you have the law of the spirit of life within you who will transform you like the apostle Paul. As Paul penned those words, he's probably the holiest man on the face of the earth. And we will mortify remaining sin the rest of our days by the spirit of God who's been given to us. And so what I want you to catch this morning is your potential is amazing. Because the Holy Spirit of God that is now the ruling force in my life. And I want you to hear this. I don't look at any sin any longer and say, no way. I, I'm just going to have this to glory no matter what. You can't say that with the Holy Spirit within us. I say I have the law of the spirit of life. Oh, spirit, Holy Spirit, do what I cannot do. And he's going to say, you must mortify the deeds of the flesh by his Spirit. There are means that we're to do. But what I want you to hear this morning, the means of grace cannot mortify sin. You can do all those things and never grow. Those means lead me to the source that can put to death sin in my body. So I can't put to death any sin in my body. It must be the Holy Spirit, the law of the spirit of life. And I declare to myself and you witnesses. I, uh, one of my friends told me this two weeks ago. We tend to manage sin more than mortify it. And we're going to flush that out what that means. We, we tend to just kind of manage our sin instead of put it to death. 
by the Spirit. And as a church, we're going to dig in and we're going to learn by the Spirit how to kill sin. We're on a mission to mortify sin together through the Spirit that dwells in each one of us. Don't you want to help each other? I need your help. We need each other. But for what? To manage sin so we look good and everything feels right? Or to put it to death? We want to mortify it. And we're to be a picture of transformation, not guys and girls that are forgiven and we just act like the rest of the world. That's nonsense. We're not under the law of sin and death. We're under the law of the spirit of life. And so we have remaining sin that fights and battles us till our last breath. But we have the Holy Spirit of God who has given to us all things necessary for life and godliness. Through him, I have everything that I need for life and godliness and putting to death sin. Quit expecting so little. I have the power of God in me. Transform my inner man was the prayer in Ephesians. Transform it, renew it. Change, because that's where all change comes from the inside to the outside. Holy Spirit of God, transform the inside so that I live the way Jesus Christ walked on this earth. The commentator Douglas Moo, this isn't profound, but I liked it. Sin and death ruled what you were in Adam. And now the Spirit rules now what you are in Christ. It's not very tricky, is it? It's beautiful, though. In Christ, both verses, we have two things. We have pardon. There's no condemnation for you this morning in your justification. And we have power for transformation in Christ. And both are the grace of God. And that's the only way this will ever take place is by his power. And so that's the freedom that's been gained. I've been set free from the law of sin and death. And now I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So now let's take a look at our second point in verses three and four. Is our frailty fixed? And so as we come to verse three, we have another contrast. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin and the flesh. <clears throat> so another contrast is a weak law. A weak law and a willing savior is what is being contrasted here. So let's look at the weak law for what the law could not do. What could the law not do? Well, it, it could not condemn sin in the flesh, right? 3C. But wait a minute. I thought the law was really good at that. Remember Romans 3, 19 to 20? The, the law condemns, it shuts your mouth, it silences you before God. Uh, I, I thought it did it really well. It said it made it transgression when the law came. Now it's transgression against the revealed will of God. It condemned for sinning against God. The soul that sins must die. I lived under that condemnation. I thought the law did a really nice job of condemning sin in the flesh. It got me good. It didn't feel very weak to me. Well, let's dig in. Weak as it was through the flesh. Again, the, the problem is not the law. The law manifests righteousness, God's righteousness. There's no problem there. It just meets with sin. And it comes, and as weak as it is through the flesh, it just met with my sinful flesh. It aroused sin. It didn't kill sin. It made it bigger. It stirred it up. So the law couldn't kill sin. So what it could do was condemn sin. And it could declare us guilty. And the soul that sins must die. But what it could not do was bring you out from the condemning power that it had over you under the law. And it could bring you out from its ruling power of the law of sin and death that it had over you. That's been the whole book of Romans. We've seen this on every turn. The law could not justify you it could not sanctify you. Law is not going to get you right with God and it's not going to make you holy. There's a whole movement in our, our uh, America that the law can make you holy. The law can't justify you and it can't sanctify you. Weak as it is through the flesh. So the law was unable to do it. So how do we get it? Two words. 
Verse 3, God, God did. God did. You know what that is? But now. Romans 3.21, but now. There was no hope, so God had to act. And he did. And he sent his son into this world to fix this problem. And he condemned sin in the flesh. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The law could not do what I'm about to explain. It's why we needed an, a new covenant where Christ would fulfill all the requirements of the old covenant. He would die in our place and he would live in our place. And the law could not get condemnation off of you. Do you hear that this morning? If you keep rubbing up to the law and going to it, it can't get condemnation off of you. It can only condemn you. That's what you got to get out from under the law. But weak as it was through the flesh, law, it could not get condemnation off of you. It could just pronounce condemnation upon you. How could law get you out of this place? It put you in this place. It made you guilty. It shut your mouth. It pronounced condemnation on you. But wait a minute, pastor. If going to church and being a good person and trying to follow God's word can't help me, then what can? God did. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. What did he do? Well, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He set you free from the law of sin and death by the law of the spirit of life. He condemned sin in the flesh. In Romans 8, 4, now you can keep the requirements of the law, and we'll look at that next week. That's what God did. He saved you. I want you to hear this. You'll name him Jesus. Why? Because he'll save his people from their sin. That verse means more to me than it's ever meant. He can save from sin. All of its guilt and all of its power. How did God deal with sin? Every word is precious in this little verse. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So what did God do? He sent his own son. You can't make too much of this. This is the way that God fixed our dilemma. And the cost was incalculable. That's not the way a holy, just God acts. But it's the way a merciful, holy, just God acts. God has a race that death has spread to all men. And we're groveling in sin with no remedy. Law couldn't fix it. So in mercy, God sends his own son to come and do what we couldn't do. And I love that he just calls it his own son, his only begotten son. So why would God send his only begotten son into this world that he created? Well, he says he did it in the likeness of sinful flesh. He put deity in a body. So this is speaking of the incarnation. God would lie in Bethlehem's manger, the offspring of a woman. He who made the heavens and the earth would dwell in a manger. Romans 10, therefore, or Hebrews 10, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, a sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Paul's really careful here to hold up the doctrine of the sinless Christ. <coughs> he carefully chooses his words with precision when he says the likeness. He wanted to capture the idea of Christ taking on humanity, coming into this world, but he wanted to guard his infinite purity of holy God. And he wanted to show how separate the son was from sinful flesh. That's why he wasn't born of Adam. He was born of his spirit. And he also wants to capture that there's a real identification with our fallen humanity. He took on flesh yet without sin. And so he, he sent his son into the world in that condition. So why? Why would he come into this world? Why would he identify with us? Why would God take on flesh? so that he could be an offering for sin and he condemned sin in the flesh. God could do what the law could not do. And he could break sin's power. And he did it through Jesus Christ. 
Nothing else can break the power of sin. Christ defeated sin. He came on account of sin. It says he came to be an offering for sin. God sent him to be a sacrifice for it. He came to be offered up as a sin offering. Our sin was laid on the precious substitute and God smote him as he hung on Calvary's tree for my sin. He who knew no sin became sin on my behalf. That tree was God being made a curse for all my sin. It's the foundation of our forgiveness and others. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin, the law of sin and death, and live to righteousness, the law of the Holy Spirit. For by his wounds you were healed. Sin had to be condemned, and it was condemned by the means of a substitute. And the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is substitution. The one bracing himself and bearing the full wrath of God for our sins. And we hear him cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because of sin. Because it must be condemned. He took the full condemnation that we deserved. God condemned sin in his flesh. So that now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He was condemned so that you wouldn't have to be. That's the love of God. The Savior did what the law could not do. The law could only condemn me. Christ can forgive me and put no condemnation over my head. This can cleanse the guiltiest of conscience this morning. My sin was dealt with on Calvary. You are not beyond hope this morning wherever you sit. Whatever sin you're in this morning, there's a Savior for sin. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Now verse 4. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this is what's called a hinna clause, and it's a, a purpose or a reason. And that now we can actually fulfill the law, which is to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. And we will take that up next week. But I'm going to close. John Stott had a nice summary. He said, God condemned sin in Christ so that holiness might appear in us. I pray that you would not turn to the law to get justified. You'll only get condemnation. I pray that you would not turn to the law to get sanctified. You'll only get weakness, condemnation. And I pray that that we would pull a Romans 7, 4. My brethren, you were made to die the law to the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. So I want to come to the table and I want us to um, remember the one who was condemned so that I could have no condemnation here this morning. The one who fulfilled the law in my place. And so let's pray, and then we'll pass out the elements. Father, I come before you. These words are amazing. And they're not just words, they're the word of God, so they're true. And I thank you that we sit here as believers with not a drop of condemnation upon us. And I thank you that that foundation sets us free. And we're no longer under the law of sin and death. But now your spirit takes up residence. And he changes our hearts and he changes our loves and our desires. So that now we can walk in freeness. We can walk in newness of life because of this gospel. And so I pray that everyone in this room gets Romans 8.1 before Romans 8.2. God, don't let anyone mix it up. If anyone's doing that this morning, let them have freedom. Let them look to the cross and live. God, I pray that you would transform this church 
as we behold justification and understand it, and we've turned it around and prayed over it and loved it and tried to comprehend every one of Paul's arguments to this place, God, I pray that everyone in this, this room would rest in Christ. They would believe in him and look to him alone for this acceptance. Weak as the law was to the flesh, there is no one in here who can get this condemnation off by working. God, let them die to that this morning. And come to Jesus who can give rest for their souls. And God, I pray for this body. Do not let us manage sin, but mortify it by your spirit. Lord, awaken us to how much you hate sin. All we have to do is look at a cross with the Son of God being condemned. to See how much you hate sin and how much you hate our sin. God, you hate sin. Please, by your spirit, let us hate it, not play with it and cuddle it. God, let us put it to death by your spirit. Let us be a church that labors for this together, that we live into the fullness of our justification and we fight together to put to death all this gross stuff that hates you and resists you and wants to defame your name. God, I pray, don't let us give our members to sin, but to this beautiful Christ. God, use us for your name's sake and change and transform us. And I thank you now as we come to the table, would you meet us here? God, would our hearts be flooded with the beauty of the one condemned in our place. God, let let us have fullness of joy as we remember this together. You came for sinners among who I am foremost And now we get to remember the one who was condemned in our place. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's in his beautiful, precious name that we do pray. Amen.